Ludovica. I'm a structural engineer at Arup and I'm involved in um, sustainability um, efforts within Arup and I've also been supporting the Parts Ed team over the past year. Um, Orlando, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, great to be here. Um, so I'm an embodied carbon specialist at Arup um, where I get the pleasure of working with Ludi um, and I'm also uh, I'm involved in lots of industry initiatives um, to try and measure and reduce um, embodied carbon and whole life carbon, um, which is how I know Tim. Hi everyone, <clears throat> Tim Dendecker. I'm an associate at Field and Clegg Bradley Studios. We're architects um, and I also do quite a lot of work with um, uh, outfits like Letty, um, focusing on, on embodied carbon and circular economy, etc. I thought I might just give a, a quick 30 seconds intro of what, what, how Part Z came about. Um, about two years ago, we, we sort of got noises from government that they didn't really know much about embodied carbon and wanted to know more. So I set up a, a number of, pulled together a number of experts, including Orlando, to go and talk to government departments and to do lunch and learn sessions on embodied carbon. And we spoke to people like Bayes, the um, Cabinet Office Infrastructure Projects Authority, MHCLG, as Deluxe was then called, etc. And um, the more conversations we had, the more we realized that actually th th they were quite busy with their own stuff. And in particular, MHCLG was focusing on fire regulations, part B, post Grenfell, and sorting all that out. And they had very little manpower sort of committed to, um, well, we felt there was, um, we could really help. Um, and so what we did was we we basically, Will Arnold and I, Will Arnold from iStructe, decided we'd write um, a, a, a um, part Z ourselves. And we thought we'd just do that. Um, and um, part Z uh, it, it cont contains, uh, uh, consists of an approved document and some text to, to amend the building regulations 2010. We thought, well, we'd do that and we, we'd send it out and, and, and that would be that, but then we realized actually it'd be really good to, to demonstrate to government that um, there's actually quite a lot of industry support. So we've been um, sort of uh, gathering uh, supporting statements and all of that's available on our website and there'll be a, a link to that um, at the end of the presentation. But I'll, I'll hand over to Ludi to, to do the bulk of the presentation. Um, there'll be some case studies at the end and we'll also have a, a little chat about next steps, what's gonna happen with Part Z um, and, and then hopefully lots of questions. Thank you. Great, so I'll um, kick off. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for making the time to come to this presentation. Um, as Simon and Tim and Orlando have just said, we'll be talking about whole life carbon in the built environment and giving an overview of the Part Z initiative. Um, Tim's just run through this very high level brief summary of what we're going to go through. Um, so firstly, introducing what embodied carbon is, why regulation is needed now, then introducing Part Z um, and its key requirements. Um, and then providing a few case studies of carbon calculation in practice and things to keep an eye out on that will be coming up soon in relation to this. Um, and finally, we'll leave some time for Q&A so we can answer any questions you may have. So to kick the session off, can I just check that the slides are changing and you are seeing things move? Okay, good. <laughs> so um, to start off with, let's first make sure we're all on the same page about what embodied carbon is and why we as built environment professionals should be interested in it. So let's start from the top. Whole life carbon of a building, you'll probably know as a measure of the greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle of the building. So in this context, when we say carbon, we mean carbon dioxide equivalent, which is a measure of greenhouse gas emissions. And this can be split up into two types. There's embodied carbon and operational carbon. Bodied carbon is carbon associated with construction materials and processes, and that's what we'll focus on in this presentation, um, while operational carbon is carbon associated with energy and water use in operation of the building. And there are many different processes that contribute to the carbon impact of a building over its life cycle. Um, I'm going to run through these briefly, um, all the stages as defined within the British standards. And just as a heads up, anything you see in pink represents an embodied carbon contribution in particular. 
So carbon is first emitted for a building when its components are produced, uh, transported to site and installed. These are called the A stages. And then during its use when its materials are maintained and repaired or replaced entirely. Um, in the in-use stage, we also met carbon to keep the building a good temperature, ventilated, supplied with water, etc. But these are operational emissions, so we're going to keep those separate for the time being. And finally, carbon is also emitted at the end of life when we have to take the building apart and dispose of or recycle its materials. So there are also actually carbon impacts beyond the building's life cycle, known as stage D emissions, um, which are a good measure of the circularity of a building. But when we talk about whole life carbon, we're looking at stages A to C, and any D calculations are reported separately. Um, this classification, so the A, B, C, D stages, um, they're set out in the British standards, as I've said, and this is widely used in the industry because it provides a clear way to define the boundaries of different contributions to carbon emissions and communicate the scope of a carbon assessment. So typically we talk of two key numbers when we're talking of carbon emissions. There's the whole life carbon figure, which includes, includes um, stages A to C, um, and upfront carbon or cradle to plaque practical completion, as you can see at the bottom, uh, which includes the A stages only. So this is a measure of the carbon emitted before the building is handed over and becomes operational in effect. So this is all well and good, but why should we care about embodied carbon? What is its significance? Um, well, we should care because it quite simply can't be ignored and will become an ever more prominent share of built environment emissions. So the built environment already accounts for 25% of UK greenhouse gas emissions. And for a typical building compliant with current regulations, about a third of this is embodied carbon. However, this is set to change over the next decade with the building regulations and a decarbonizing electricity grid pushing the reduction of operational carbon. Um, operational emissions are directly linked to operational energy use, which is limited by part L of the building regulations, but there is no parallel regulation limiting embodied carbon emissions at the moment. This means our embodied carbon emissions will contribute an increasing proportion of the whole life carbon emissions for most buildings, um, with one study already showing that over two thirds of a low energy new buildings emissions are embodied, as you can see there at the bottom. This um, graph, which is taken from the UK Green Building Council's net zero roadmap, shows embodied carbon emissions of the UK building sector have remained pretty stable at around 50 megatons of embodied carbon equivalent, um, of carbon dioxide equivalent, sorry, per year uh, over the last 30 years, which is more than aviation and shipping combined. Um, even though we can see a dip during the recession, aside from that, this graph stresses that we actually cannot expect the construction industry operating under business as usual to yield any significant embodied carbon reductions in the next 10 years. So this leads us nicely into why the time is right for embodied carbon regulation. Firstly, there's a global precedent for it. Um, many countries already have um, such regulation, but policy development and implementation is typically a multi-year process. So it's sort of um, the gears are starting to click into place now. Um, the Netherlands introduced regulation around this nearly 10 years ago, and Sweden, France, and others are following. Um, the EU Commission actually has published proposals that from 2027, all large buildings will have to do this across the entirety of the EU. So this includes countries far poorer equipped to do so than we are in the UK, so we really have no excuse. Um, and what is interesting is that countries are making different choices in the details of regulation. So there are lots of lessons the UK could learn from this big natural experiment um, when developing its own policies. Um, what this list also makes clear is that the UK is falling behind, um, because if we don't have something in place by mid-decade, then we'll be an outlier. Getting something in place by mid-decade means starting work on developing the policy now and communicating the direction of travel in strategy so that key stakeholders can get on board with this. Um, a good example is uh, the Swedish approach, um, where the roadmap was shared, setting key dates into the future for assessment and then expansion of assessment scope, um, the setting of limits, reduction of these limits, et cetera, um, which gives 
clarity on the intended policy progression and allows the market to prepare and grow ahead of time. Um, secondly, so why now? Um, we know embodied carbon regulation is necessary to reduce these emissions in line with the UK government's legally binding net zero targets. Uh, the government uh, was the first in the world to write net zero emissions into law, and the UK has also passed legally binding carbon budgets and made commitments at COP26 aligned with its net zero ambitions. Um, the net zero strategy sets out the UK government's roadmap to achieve net zero by 2050 and the carbon budgets along the way. However, policies still need to be developed and the strategy does not address built, in, built environment embodied carbon emissions. So there is a gap that needs to be filled. Um, thirdly, there's an ever stronger call for regulation. Uh, the Climate Change Committee has been recommended since 2018 that the government needs to set out a plan for phasing in whole life carbon reporting with legal limits set by 2025. And the environment, Environmental Audit Committee um, has published a report in May this year uh, on building to net zero. And this said that the single most significant policy the government could introduce is a mandatory requirement to undertake whole life carbon assessments for buildings. Um, and that in doing this, the government should develop progressive, progressively ratcheting carbon targets to match the pathway to net zero. Um, in fact, the select committee also called on government to mandate whole life carbon assessments for buildings no later than December 2023. So accelerating um, this, this date. And fourthly, we see that um, industry recognizes the importance of embodied carbon regulation itself. In a survey conducted by Letty, um, client requirements, specifications, and regulation were voted as the factors considered most likely to reduce embodied carbon in buildings. And of these three, policy is the most influential because it provides a consistent way to drive for low embodied carbon on all projects, irrespective of the client and project team. And then finally, as Tim was mentioning before, the industry support and readiness for this is clear. Um, through the Part Z website, we have been receiving numerous statements of support for mandated reporting and limiting of embodied carbon. So far from over 180 firms, um, and these span all sorts of um, backgrounds, so from investors, developers, consultants, contractors, institutions and more and we're keeping on sort of counting the support that's coming in so that's really positive so in summary time is right for embodied carbon regulation because there's a global precedent for it it's aligned and supports uh, government commitments in the environmental advisory and auditing bodies have made regular recommendations to government for the introduction of such regulation Industry feedback has identified it as a key factor to achieving low carbon ambitions, and there is industry support and readiness for it. So this set sets the stage quite nicely for part Z, and um, we'll now run through sort of the key principles and requirements of it. So we said that the aim is for construction industry to play its part in meeting um, the UK's um, legally binding uh, carbon targets. So there, there is um, one that's set in the sixth carbon budget, which is uh, to reduce carbon emissions by 2035 by 78%. Um, to do this, we need to push the industry to reduce its emissions. And we can do this effectively by setting maximum limits on embodied carbon emissions so that only buildings that are within this efficiency limit get built. But how do we ensure that appropriate limits are set, um, meaning ones that are achievable yet ambitious so we can decarbonize the construction industry whilst not also crippling it? Um, for this, we need data uh, so we can understand the current carbon performance of buildings and set budgets for future buildings. And so this is essentially um, the two policy requirements, one for whole life carbon assessments and another for um, carbon efficiency. And here we see those same two requirements laid out within the proposed Part Z amendment to building regulations acting as a proof of concept for the embodied carbon regulation that's needed in the UK. 
Um, you can see on the right hand side there are square brackets, um, and these are used as placeholders for key cutoff limits and dates um, and suggestions um, for these from the Part Z authors are also included. Um, so we can see that it's proposed um, that there is a cap to applicability so that small projects would be exempt from these requirements to maximize um, achievability. And the introduction of these requirements would be staggered. Proposal is for um, reporting across most building types to start next year, but with house building following in 2025. And after a few years of data collection, um, when we can set robust embodied carbon efficiency limits, um, this would happen in 2027, at which point requirement Z2 would also take effect. Um, and feedback from industry has been positive and sort of signifies that these suggested dates are achievable. And actually some stakeholders are calling for it sooner. And these are typically the firms who are already doing this on every project anyway, so they're, they know what, what is required of them um, and want, want to see it rolled out more widely. So every part of the building regulations has an accompanying approved document to set out what may be accepted as reasonable for compliance. So when um, writing the proposed part Z, here we've also had a proposed document Z released, um, but we're calling this accompanying document um, the proposed document Z because it's not yet been approved, but it's intended to say, serve the same purpose. Um, as an approved document. So it's a very short seven pager because it references the de facto UK carbon standard, which you may have heard the RICS professional statement, um, whole life carbon assessment for the built environment. And the proposed document Z sets out requirements for the whole life carbon assessments in terms of method, scope, timing, and reporting. And this will ensure consistency in approach and data collection. So a whole life carbon assessment should be conducted in line with the RICS professional statement, as we said, um, before and after construction and uploaded to an online portal. Um, it's proposed that the built environment carbon database, the ECD, which Orlando will take us through in a second, um, is used for this because it's free to use and it's planned to be launched um, early next year. And this is being developed by a cross industry team of collaborators and will include a buildings database. So it's um, prime for this application. Um, proposed document Z also sets out the limits on embodied carbon that would need to be achieved for future carbon assessments. The document proposes that limits are set for different building typologies and that these are reviewed and reduced over time. For example, at three year intervals. Um, to start with, uh, it would, it's proposed that only upfront carbon, so the A stage that we were looking at before, is limited by regulation. And this would enable building control officers to sign off compliance with Part Z by simply reviewing final material quantities and carbon factors used in the building. However, over time, the expectation is for limits to be expanded to cover all aspects of embodied carbon, so match the whole life carbon scope of the initial um, assessment requirement. So to consult all these at your own leisure, you can download the proposed Part Z and Document Z from our website via the proposal page there at the top. And you can also view about half of the statements of support on the industry support page. Now we'll have a look at how carbon is calculated in practice and what can be learned from this. And we've got a few um, case studies to help um, sort of share the point. So the principle of calculation itself is very simple. You essentially multiply a quantity of a product by a carbon factor. Um, and you do this for every life cycle module. And you sum this to get the total project impact for your scope of assessment. So it's nothing more really than a glorified multiplication and summation. But it can tell us volumes about the carbon impact of a built asset and where the largest car carbon contributions lie. Um, and this helps to inform design decisions to reduce uh, this impact. So by building up a database of such calculations, we can also start to identify typical carbon intensities for different building types and spot trends. 
Um, so on this note, um, Arup conducted a whole life carbon study for the World Building Council for Sustainable Development. Um, the study looked at six buildings spanning residential, commercial, office, and mixed-use typologies. And the intention was to provide an insight into current industry carbon performance. Um, this found that on average, the whole life carbon footprint across the six case studies was 1,800 um, kilogram of CO2 equivalent per meter squared. And that about half of this was due to embodied carbon. This was mostly upfront carbon with building structure taking the largest part of that first pie on the slide that you can see that covers A1 to A5 modules. Um, however, the large uh, in use contribution from building services that you can see in the second pie chart means that building services and structure each account for about a third of the whole life carbon emissions of these buildings on average. Um, now I'll hand over to Tim, who will explore the embodied carbon impact of building services a little bit closer. So Tim, if you're happy to pick up. Yeah, great. Thanks, Lily. Um, on the next slide. Yeah, so, so one of the, the areas that still uh, uh, requires a little bit of work is the, the MEP uh, components of buildings. And um, it, it, the, 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 the question a lot of people ask us is how, how do you calculate the embodied carbon for that in the absence of um, EPD, which are the environmental product declarations, which give you a, a really for, for products. Manufacturers produce these for products at cost to themselves to give you a good sense of um, the emissions uh, upfront and during the life to, to repair and maintain the products. Um, there currently we, we recommend there's two ways of, of um, accounting, allowing for the, the MEP embodied carbon in the project. On the left hand side are some estimates of upfront cradle to gate embodied carbon uh, done by Letty in their embodied carbon primer a few years ago. Um, and these are being updated, but you could use these as sort of um, uh, uh, um, um, placeholder factors in your calculations in the absence of more information to get some, especially at the um, at the start of a project when you're, you're doing some sort of high level design calculations to, to try and, um, you know, uh, let the design respond to the carbon needs and vice versa. Um, these figures need to be approximately doubled if you want to do whole life carbon. Um, this is to allow for um, the things that are most frequently replaced in buildings are in fact the the services, the building services, um, particular uh, things, mechanical uh, services such as air handling units, etc. Um, so, hence, for offices and schools, you can see these these quantities are, are a much bigger proportion of the, the total. Um, alternatively, you can calculate it, and if there is no EPD uh, available for for the um, building services components, you can follow the methodology set up in SIPSI TM65, which was published last year. It's on the right-hand side. And there are two ways you can do that. You can do the simple calculation method um, or the slightly more um, uh, detailed, but essentially it's it's focusing on your, your upfront. Uh, you, 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 you ask, you, the, the approach SIPSI recommends is sending a questionnaire to the, the manufacturers of the kit that you're intending to put in the building. And there are questions about um, what, what um, materials are, are uh, contained in the, in the kit, etc. And so there are, that sets out the calculations, which is once you have the material quantities for a piece of m &E kit, it's fairly easy to follow the methodology. So um, we recommend you have a look at that. Um, the next slide contains a, a, a case study, which is um, just showing the process that we at, at Phil and Clay Bradley go through when we sort of at the, the project inception stage compare various options and their their um, embodied and, and energy embodied carbon and energy consumption we use this, uh, the tool called SUS carbon which is a quick calculation tool um, and we see we've just compared five um, different height buildings for a residential development um, and comparing both um, sort of um, materials and energy consumption so we, we've seen this different types of superstructure the first three are clt 
The, the third one is because it's taller, it needs to be encapsulated for fire um, purposes. And the taller you get, the more steel and concrete makes sense. It's, it's no longer um, useful to have a full CLT frame. The passive house form factors there are quite quite interesting. They, they show they determine the the um, energy use um, and heat loss. Um, number of beds for the developers, just to see efficiency of use of the land. Um, the embodied cal carbon uh, calculations and the sequestered carbon are there um, on the, the fourth and fifth lines. You'll see that, um, interestingly, the, um, um, uh, well, the, the timber obviously has lower embodied carbon because um, it, you don't have the emissions of concrete and steel, and you also sequester the, the carbon um, in the timber. So that needs to be reported separately. Um, and, and we've shown that there. It, it's estimated energy use is pretty constant per square meter, and um, your offsets are, are, are allowing for the photovoltaics on the roof to offset your regulated energy um, uh, consumption. So that, that's one example of sort of the types of calculations that we, in, in an architect with our engineers, uh, do up front. And the next slide is, is sort of showing the relationship between um, um, embodied carbon and operational carbon. Now, this is a case study we did for an existing uh, UK hospital um, and with the options to do a new build or a retrofit. Um, and these are the Q, uh, just, just, just a minute, sorry, Lily. Um, this is a hospital, but it could be any non-residential building. Um, it shows the cumulative whole life carbon emissions over the life of a building. And typically for a new build, these are the proportions that you would see. And so, um, as, as Ludi explained earlier, we really do, we're seeing our operational carbon emissions going down. This is B6, the orange bit at the top there. And we really comparing that to, um, to the embodied carbon, um, we're seeing for a new build, obviously, you're spending a lot of carbon up front. Um, so yes, if you go to the next slide now, thanks, Lenny. Um, we're seeing that if the, the option for this hospital was to do either new builds and knock it down, um, build it new or retrofit, you can see there in retrofit, all the embodied carbon components, which are the reds and the pinks, are a lot lower. Um, you still obviously need to do uh, your replacement um, and upgrades of your MEP kit during the life of the building. Um, and then the, the alternative is obviously to do nothing, which would be the next, um, Lily, the next one. Thank you. Um, and you can see there, if you don't upgrade your system's efficiency, um, you are back to square one where we currently are, you know, where, you know, your, your old part, part L is allowing you to for, for operational emissions to be the bulk of your your um, your energy consumption and therefore carbon emissions. So yeah, and, and I think there's two more clicks and they just sort of um, compare. This one is the, the first one is you can see better to retrofit because it's better from an embodied carbon perspective and you will all, always get the benefits in the reductions of B6, which is your operational carbon. So you can see that the B6 of the retrofit cumulatively is as much as the the, um, uh, the new build. So you get a massive benefit there by upgrading your systems, upgrading your building fabric. Doing nothing, yes, you probably spend less um, embodied carbon up front. Um, and you still need to have your backlog maintenance, which is that the, the bottom red, red bar. Um, but over the 60 year life of this building, you are going to emit more um, carbon. And this is even allowing for um, uh, renewables and sort of the, the, the operational carbon emission reductions due to uh, tra um, transfer to renewable energy sources. Even allowing for that, you're seeing that it's more than a new building. So that's our. Um, uh, those are two examples that I have to offer. I know Orlando is going to talk uh, about a couple uh, more now. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. My internet just yeah, froze at perfect. like the worst time possible. Sure. <laughs> um, and just so, just to kind of carry on from um, from Tim's examples of looking at 
different options sort of at the really early stage of design this is this is an example from a project i worked on a few years ago um it's just where it, this assessment is only uh, embodied carbon carbon but um it's where we we basically helped um the, the client get through a refurb and extension option of a of a tall building in in the center of london and victoria um um through uh, the planning process um, as opposed to a demolish and rebuild scheme. And that was largely influenced by the carbon numbers. So it's just the point that it's obviously design teams are wanting to, or, or ho hopefully wanting to do more to address um, carbon emissions. But also um, if you do do that as a design team member, then it's likely that um, people are gonna receive that very well. And, and in this case, we help to kind of um, get a, a much lower carbon version of of the same scheme um through the planning process which was really good um next please and and just to kind of give some context and i think this is this is really important especially when if you're presenting your carbon numbers um in in meetings or to or to anyone who's a a human um to kind of contextualize just the the quantity of carbon um in what we do as individuals so the fact that this reduction of 54% saves 34,000 tonnes of CO2, that's basically equivalent to the entire, more, more than the entire population of, of Arab London, which is 2,500 people um, for a whole year. So in terms of kind of um, a good impact that you can have on the planet, doing it on your projects is really kind of the really, really big way in which you can do that. Next slide, please, Adi. Um, and then kind of going from the really early design stages where you're considering where you're challenging the brief, um, just to kind of also say that this exercise of, of, of understanding the carbon emissions associated with different options, even at the detailed design stage, when you're looking at small details of a building, um, should be done and can be used to, to help inform um, reductions in carbon emissions. So my, back, my background is structural engineering. So apologies for, for the kind of structures focused examples but on the left hand side it's just kind of very simple considering using a different type of column um, for a steel steel frame building helps save considerable amount of carbon emissions um, and even though that two, 222 tons of co2 might be kind of in the order of magnitude of one or two percent of the entire building's carbon footprint it's still a lot of carbon emissions to save and is something that that kind of can be changed for very little impact on the project. Um, and also um, there, there's a cantilever on this project, which we um, agreed with the architects to shorten by a meter, like cantilevers operating over 15 stories. So again, had a huge impact on the carbon emissions just by kind of making a small change like that. So it's, it's really kind of having in your mindset throughout the project and um, just the value of um, the value of having your mindset of um, assessing all of the options that are being considered. Whenever there's a design decision to make, we should be considering the carbon emissions associated with that to inform um, where we can make these, these smaller wins that will add up to quite a lot when we, when we add them all together at the end of the project. Next slide, please. Um, and just to, and just I thought it was worth, worth flagging this as well, the City of London Whole Life Carbon Assessment Guidance that's come out um, uh, recently or was consulted on recently kind of sets out a, a way to kind of essentially do what what Tim showed what Field and Clegg Bradley Studios are doing really well um, by considering the different options and um, so you've got um, no intervention minor refurb major refurb and new build options and showing where how long it takes to pay back the the initial carbon investment that you've um, that you've put into uh, to make the change to that to that site um, so you can kind of see and also just to compare the the options over the life cycle so so combining embodied and operational which is particularly important for for MEP systems which the majority of you will be would be focusing on um, is really really key and so kind of doing all that work with TM65 that was mentioned is, is really critical to, to informing that next slide please uh, and just a couple of notes on kind of related initiatives to Part Z. Um, next slide, please. And the first of which is UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standard, um, which I think has already been mentioned. But this is really to, to help define a, a robust approach to verifying net zero carbon buildings in the UK. 
um, targets and limits for energy use and, and carbon emissions will be set alongside some other performance metrics. This is all in development at the moment, by the way, that the working groups were established earlier in the summer um, and a kind of a beta version of this is, is scheduled to be released in around April next year. Um, it will also cover approaches to take for carbon accounting and procurement of renewable energy. There's a webinar on the 17th of November, really encourage you to, to sign up to that um, to understand what's going on uh, and, and how you can contribute to the call for evidence for data to, to inform some of those initial targets and, and limits on, um, on those metrics. Next slide, please. Uh, and the BCD, the Built Environment Carbon Database, and this is something that's and the need for this has been identified when kind of some of that the initial guidance around embodied carbon uh, for um, for RICS and and for the ISTRUC T um, uh, and others was kind of, was starting and we really kind of identified that we're advising people on how to calculate carbon but where are they going to share the data so that we can actually um, get into this reinforcing loop uh, where we drive down carbon emissions of collecting data that means we understand. And the current progress and contract progress that will allow us to set targets, regulate it, and focus efforts. That will allow us to calculate and reduce carbon better. And it's kind of a, a, a reinforcing loop. And that's kind of really what I think PARZ is helping to it's helping to achieve. Um, and there are two parts of the BCD. One is the entity level, so that's project carbon, which Lydia's already mentioned, which kind of part Z would feed into. Uh, but there's also a product level and um, database that's being developed, which is kind of a, a digitized collection of, of carbon factor data for products. Um, there's a consultation on kind of the use of the platform, which closes on the 16th of December. Um, so I'd really recommend kind of visiting the BCD website to, the, to kind of to check it out and provide your feedback on and um, be really useful to make sure that's a resource that that is that is really well supported in future. Next slide, please. Hand over to Tim. Yeah, um, just Closing off with sort of a, a slight, uh, just a, sorry, a quick reminder of where we are currently in terms of um, liaising with the the um, legislators. Um, you may be aware that Jerome Mayhew um, has um, reintroduced Duncan Baker's 10 minute rule bill. Um, the Duncan Baker's 10 minute rule bill was um, uh, read out in Parliament earlier this year, but because Duncan Make Baker is now um, a uh, uh, works uh, as a, a, a private parliamentary secretary in the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, he's no longer uh, able to to keep that bill in Parliament. So it was taken over by Jerome. Um, Jerome um, Jerome's bill is aligned with all the proposals that are put forward in Part Z. Um, we were actually working with Jerome on, on this bill, the Part Z authors, and um, the, the um, first reading of that bill was held in the House of Commons in June. The second reading is expected next week, Friday, the, the um, 25th of November, and will be debated. So that's a good first step now. Um, it, it's useful to know that um, uh, as a an alternative to getting the part Z proposals legislated, it could just be the Secretary of State for the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, um, who is Michael Gove at the moment. Uh, again, is um, that that can be done? Um, the, the Secretary of State could just take the proposals currently um, and. Um, can just rubber stamp them and and uh, amend the building regulations 2010 himself. Um, there is currently um, the Environmental Audit Committee, um, as, as you saw earlier, has um, uh, was published earlier this year. Its findings on uh, um, um, carbon and government has responded to that, and the the, um, the proposals were aligned with Part Z. The government has says we recognize your proposals and we're going to consult on that in 2023. Now, hopefully that process happens quite quickly. Um, as you may remember, the, the Part Z proposals recommend that the reporting of embodied carbon starts in 2023 um, with limits um, on embodied carbon, oh, sorry, for 2023 for non-residential buildings, 2025 for residential buildings. 
Um, it's also worth noting that the Part Z proposals um, are for larger developments only, so they do not apply to buildings um, smaller than a, a thousand square meters or developments of 10 residential units or less. So it, it, it sort of um, looks at the more sort of medium sized projects. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'd say so. We are we're we're keen to to talk. The part Z horses are available to talk to government, and um, government's aware that we are available to talk to them and advise them. And um, hopefully, the the reading of Jerome May Hughes bill in Parma, Parliament on the twenty fifth of this month um, it carries on that momentum. I think that's all our slides. Yes, that is yes, it. That is correct. Um, final link that will um, circulate as well, perhaps in the chat. Um, if you would like to support the call for embodied carbon regulation, um, there is a way to do that on the website, um, a support section. Uh, so please do um, do share that, and um, if you want to get in touch with the Part Z authors, um, we are available at, well, not we, not <laughs> one of the others, but um, please do contact us at hello at partz.uk. Um, and yeah, that concludes our presentation. Thank you Thanks. very much um, for listening. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. An awful lot um, of just incredible work that's gone on there. Um, it's, it's very impressive. Um, all of these links have been shared on the chat, and I will um, upload the chat transcript to Meshwork. So if anyone wants to, um, if anyone wasn't able to um, click on them, then that that they will be available. Um, Guy, um, Ludi, will you will you make will you share the presentation as well, so then we can um, share it with me, and then I'll make that available to everyone who attended on the call as well, and and on, on the wider network. That would be that would be fantastic. Um, Simon, did you want to come in and ask your question? I mean, I I could um, if I if you don't mind, I can read it out. Um, yeah, Simon. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, the qu question was, when do you think Part Z might realistically be approved and become a requirement? Um, well. Uh, we were hoping for for uh, uh, as soon as possible. There is there is the consultation that government uh, intends to have during 2023. Hopefully, if that consultation is done efficiently and um, all the stakeholders are are um, uh, sort of um, interviewed and feedback is got back uh, is is received, um, they'll make the decision that yes, this is in fact a good idea. There are a lot of supporters, a lot of. Um, people across companies across the industry have given their unequivocal support. There have been some concerns noted about um, what will the smaller players do. Um, well, first of all, the smaller developments are excluded from the requirements, uh, and for the SME uh, entities, the um, there is a proposal or there is an initiative by the Future Homes Hub to um, to uh, commission. Uh, a, a free tool to do uh, calculations, um, starting with with um, the housing typologies to be made available to industry, which would mean the the um, the calculations can be done by by people who are not used to doing those calculations and can learn the the, the sort of the lexicon of carbon more quickly um, as, a, as a free tool that is easy to use. Um, uh, the next question is, is it anticipated that residential developments report embodied carbon from 2023 or 2025? Um, residential from 2025, non-residential from 2023. And we've done that simply because the, 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 the supporters of Part Z tend to be in the category of, of um, companies that do a lot of non-residential developments as well. They do do residential development. So, for example, your developers, you know, your land, your um, land leases, etc., um, land lease, land sec, etc. But um, we felt that it's because they are up and have been up and running for so much longer that they'll find it much easier to to sort of start um, next year. Thanks, Tim. Um, there's a question from Megan. Um, I think the, um, the, the 
assume lifespan exceeds 60 years, what, what do you, how do you accurately account for this within your carbon assessment? Um, and do we have any experience at Arabov or at Phil and Doug Bradley Studios relating to this? Um, the, the part said um, is based on the RICS professional statement, and the RICS professional statement um, indeed does um, put the, um, I think they call it the reference study, per study period. Study period. Sorry, thank you. Um, and that's 60 years or 120 years for infrastructure. Um, uh, Orlando, I'll let you jump in in a second, but what I did want to say and what, what is kind of interesting is that the more you project your carbon, in, the further you go into the future, the less certain your estimates are and your assumptions are. Making whole life carbon assessments is valuable because it allows you to see how sensitive to the future your design is now and which factors have an impact. So if, you, if you're choosing stuff that needs to be replaced often, say carpets versus linoleum, you can then judge that, right? And it, it, it forces you to look at the issue. But the, up, the, the estimates of upfront embodied carbon, your A1 um, your A to, to A5 modules are the, the most reliable. And that is also why um, Part Z has recommended that the limits are on upfront embodied carbon and not on whole life embodied carbon for the reason that the assumptions and the, the, the future, the projections of the future are still um, sort of a, a, an unknown and people are starting to get used to that. Um, well, I know. Um, yeah, that's a great point, Sam. And, and, and I just say that um, you can draw a reference study period like sort of it's just a study period after all 60 years is kind of the standard um but if if for whatever reasons for example your building might that your client might have a kind of a leasing structure or they might know that the building's only going to be on a on the plot in a certain time frame you can also just kind of if you if you draw those lines of carbon emissions over time you can kind of see where you might be um at different points in time from from where you are at where you are at the start of the project um and also importantly i think see how far away you are from 2050 which is when ideally we should be net zero carbon um across the built environment and every other sector so it's kind of i i'd say whenever i'm kind of drawing that line i'm thinking when is 2050 on this map um obviously considering that the whole reference study period as well um is typically 60 years um but yeah, I think you can you can kind of un understand your your pro individual project circumstances a bit and and look at what the results are at different reference study periods in addition to that, if it makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, then there's a question um, from Richard Garland, a, a grading consultant. Uh, while smaller projects are outside the scope, do we know what proportion of the industry is captured by Part Z? Very good question, Richard. And I think the 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 idea is obviously to start with the larger projects and to certainly to start with the, the companies doing the larger developments and who are already doing it. I think the answer to that question will be found um, um, during the uh, consultation period in 2023, which the, the departments, um, I, I think it's um, 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 the Department for Leveling Up and not base that's running it, but I, 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 um, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's it's doubling up that's running it. Um, the next question is from Rainer Saren. Um, how does an EPD value of a product account for the transport distances in the whole life cycle carbon assessment? Good question. Um, I think EPD are, um, will give you an indication of a typical um, transport distance from factory to a, a, a typical destination and it should say in the EPD um, what their assumptions are and you can override that so the A4 module is what we're talking about um, the RICS professional statement um, you gives you some sort of standard distances that you can assume for transport for, um, for local national EU and the world 
So what, um, you can take those distances multiplied um, by the um, the weight of whatever it is you're transporting, and then there are greenhouse gas conversion factors on the base database at um, GovUK. So you could take the EPD; it gives you your all your modules separately, and you can just take that a a um, four module and substitute your own calculations, especially if it's a, a a product overseas product and it doesn't indicate that it's sort of accounted for the transport from say China to the UK. Can I just ask on that then it's so um, from a manufacturer's perspective they're not duty bound to supply these EPDs but then you've provided the methodology for people to undertake their own calculations to, to effectively provide the EPD. I'm presuming over time as more and more people ask they will they will um, start producing them yes um, there's no mandatory uh, EPD requirement there, there are there are two two main ways you can put carbon factors in your calculations so you can use generic data or product data we recommend that certainly at the start of a project you look at generic data and the generic data you can get from either um, software or guides so the the software might be you download some free software from the iStruct E the structural carbon tool Mm -hmm. um, which is developed in, in, with Elliot Wood or the FCBS Carbon by Phil and Clark Bradley Studios or EC3 or HBird Hawkers Brown. You could pay for software and there's some really great licensed software out there, Echolab, um, the PH Ribbon, OneClick and E2 LCD. Um, but those, those license fee products aren't that that great for dealing with um, projects early on in the life cycle. But they will contain standard carbon factors um certainly you know those those uh, tools that are meant for early life stage calculation mm -hmm. the 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 license paying software tools actually contain a lot of epd already embedded but you could also look at the ice database by circular ecology that's the inventory of carbon and energy that's at circularecology.com um that would be all for generic factors and those really very helpful to do because they're quick you can do them at the start of a project just get your results and have that start influencing design or you could have your epd but there aren't that many epd out there if you compare it to the the, the universe of products yeah. available there's only one epd for brick in the uk for example so yes you you, you we, we recommend you start with the generic factors and move to epd as the project develops and you start sort of mocking in your products. Cool. Thanks for answering that. Um, fantastic presentation, guys. Fantastic session. Um, very well received. Um, yeah, I just prior to this chat, everyone, we were talking about potentially putting on a follow up um, session as well um, regarding TM65. So watch, watch this space. Um, yeah. Ludi, Tim, Orlando, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone on the call. We've reached one o'clock and I think it's, um, yeah, we've earned a cup of tea after that. There's a lot to take in. So, um, yeah, once again, thank you for all your hard work and um, looking forward to the reading um, taking place in, you, yeah. in November. We should be uh, looking forward to the next steps. Cheers, guys. Great to join thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.